energy is what makes matter do something. Okay, it's what makes matter do work. And remember from that gizmo that work represented a force being exerted on something over a certain distance. So the first type we'll look at is called mechanical energy. And that's kinetic energy that something has because of its movement. So uh, if we look at this example here, we've got the baseball bat on the ball. So there is energy in that bat as it swings and as it moves through the strike zone. And this is actually a good example of that mechanical energy being transferred from one thing to another. So the mechanical energy of the bat swinging is transferred to that ball and it changes the way that ball moves. Okay, so it exerts a force on the ball and it transfers the energy from the bat to the ball and makes that ball move a certain distance. Now mechanical energy can technically even be thought of as potential energy because of an object's position. So when we think of an object that's raised high above a surface like this guy that's going to jump 55 miles into the deep blue and uh, set some world records here, he's got potential energy. Now the next type we'll look at is called radiant energy. And that can also, like I said earlier, be called electromagnetic energy. And that's kinetic energy from electromagnetic radiation. Now it's kind of hard to picture that as movement. How, is th how are things like sunlight and uh, radiation, how are those kinetic energy? So when we think of light, light actually moves through space. I'm sure you've all heard of the speed of light. Well, the reason there's a certain speed to it is because that light is moving. And there are uh, particles, really small particles, smaller than atoms, called photons. And that's the particle that uh, sort of transmits light, the, the particle that light travels on. So if we think about this example here, we've got, and I'm not sure if anybody knows what this is, this is actually what's called a solar sail. And uh, what this is, is there's sort of that big sheet there of, uh, looks like aluminum foil, and that's spread out. And what happens is light from the sun hits that sheet and actually acts as a sail, much like a sail on a boat on the ocean. When the wind comes and pushes that sail, it moves the boat along. And it's the same with this solar sail. Light hits that sail and pushes that spacecraft along. Now this is technology that's still uh, sort of in its infancy, but it does hold a lot of promise for future space travel. Now sound energy is another type of kinetic energy. And the reason sound energy is kinetic energy is because that it occurs through vibrating waves through a substance. So, and I say a substance, but normally we think of sound traveling through air. Well, air is a substance. And what happens is something vibrates the air and sends waves through those particles. And the reason we hear things is because the movement of the air or the movement of those particles vibrate our eardrums and then we're able to, to hear. So we've got energy being created by that speaker and that's coming from another type of energy and we'll talk about transforming energy in a moment. Now gravitational energy is something that we're familiar with. We did some work with that uh, gizmo where we put objects of different weights at different heights and we were able to see uh, how that changed the gravitational potential energy. So like I said, it is potential energy that an object has because it's above a surface of something. So it's similar to that stored mechanical energy that we talked about earlier. So here we've got this giant rock perched on top of this little outcropping of rock. And it's got a lot of gravitational potential energy. And I want you to remember from the gizmo that gravitational potential energy is there because of the weight of an object or the, and the height of the object. So if we've got a really, really heavy object that's high up off the ground, it's got a lot of gravitational potential energy. Now if we have another object, like let's say a baseball, uh, at the same height it has less potential energy because it has less weight. Now again, if we were to raise that baseball further up into the air, uh, 
it would probably have to be really, really high to match the potential energy of that rock, but increasing the height of an object will increase its potential energy. Now, chemical energy is something that we've talked about, but we never really got into the energy part of. We did a little bit when we talked about photosynthesis, though. Chemical energy is potential energy that is stored in the bonds of molecules. So when atoms are joined together in a molecule, there's energy that's holding them together. And if we think about this light stick, okay, you're like, well, what does that have to do with chemical energy? Well, inside that light stick, there's two liquids. There's one liquid, and then there's another liquid inside a capsule. And when you bend that to break that capsule, you start to mix those two liquids together. And what happens is a chemical reaction occurs, and that uh, energy that is stored within the chemical bonds of those two uh, liquids that are in there, as the chemical reaction occurs, energy is now released, and in this case, in the form of light. So that stored potential ch chemical energy is now converted into a different type of energy, or transformed. Heat energy, or thermal energy, is something that we talked about as well. And that is kinetic energy from the movement of particles of a substance. So remember what we talked about when we talked about phase change. When you increase the temperature of a substance, the particles begin to move faster and faster. Okay, so the, like I say, the, the more thermal energy something has, the higher the temperature of that object or that substance. Now, electrical energy is something we're all familiar with, and a lot of times when we think of energy, that's what we think about. We think about power plants generating electrical energy so that we can do things like turn on the lights or uh, keep our food cold in the fridge. But electrical energy is kinetic energy, and it comes from the movement of electrons through substances. Okay, Now, that's kind of hard to understand, but if we think of a basic example here of an electrical wire. What an electrical wire is, is metal, generally it's copper, that's inside of a, a little plastic sheet. And what's happening in that copper is electrons are flowing through that wire. So you can see in the diagram below here, the atoms are sort of staying where they are, but the electrons are actually flowing through there. And because they're moving, they have energy. And that's how we get our electricity. Uh, that's how objects work. Now, the last type that we'll talk about is nuclear energy. Now, I know a lot of times people sort of get this queasy feeling when they hear nuclear energy, but uh, we're not talking about nuclear power. We're talking about nuclear energy, which is where nuclear power comes from. However, when we, we just want to look at the source of energy. So nuclear energy... Uh, comes from the nucleus of an atom. It's the potential energy that is stored within that nucleus of the atom. And it's there because uh, the particles that are in a nucleus of an atom are trying to push themselves away from each other. It's kind of like trying to put two of the same ends of a, um, of a magnet next to one another. They repel each other. The positively charged protons in a, the nucleus of an atom trying to repel one another. They're trying to push away from each other. So it takes uh, a force to hold them together. And that, uh, that stored energy is nuclear energy. So here's a, a diagram or a picture that shows sort of uh, how that energy is released. When, you, when the nucleus of the atom is split, some of that energy is released because it no longer has to hold those particles together. Energy is defined as the capacity to do work. Now, another word for capacity is ability. And if you are wondering what a body means, it simply refers to objects or things that includes living things and non-living things like machines. So how do we understand this? Well, for example, you are at the ground floor of a tall building. The lift is presently at the 10th floor. So when you press the up button of the lift, the lift starts to move down to the first floor. So what really causes the lift to move down? Well, clearly something has done some work to move the lift down. 
The thing that moves the leaf down is the leaf motor. And this motor has the ability to do some work that results in the leaf being moved down. In other words, the motor has used some energy to move the leaf up or down. For this particular example, it has actually moved down from the 10th floor to the 1st floor. Now, take note as well, the SI unit of energy is joules and it is represented by this capital J. Now, let's have a look at the many different forms of energy. Okay, energy exists in many different forms. Okay, in this particular slide, we have shown uh, eight different forms of energy that we know of today. Right, potential energy, chemical energy, electrical, sound, nuclear, light, heat or thermal energy, and lastly, kinetic energy. Okay, well, could there be more? Well, who knows? Only the future will tell. Okay. Now, this brings us to a list uh, that's showing the eight different kinds of energy. All right. So, for this particular chapter 6, we shall only focus on two forms of energy. That is the kinetic energy and potential energy. Now, both these forms of energy are collectively known as mechanical energy. So, in other words, if you were to hear the term mechanical energy, this can refer to either kinetic or potential energy. Mechanical en energy is a form of energy usually associated with moving objects. A car moving at certain speed, a plane increasing its height, a durian fruit dropping to the ground, and so on. Hence, you will find that when we discuss the concepts related to movement, for example, speed and acceleration of an object, we often involve a mechanical energy as well. This is the law of conservation of energy. It says that energy cannot be created or destroyed but it can be transferred from one form to another. You need to know about the different forms of energy. This mnemonic might help you to learn them. Each of the letters in this mnemonic stands for an energy form. M could be for magnetic, K kinetic or movement energy, H for heat, L for light, G gravitational, C for chemical, S is for sound, E electrical, another E for elastic, and N for nuclear. Let's look at how different devices transfer energy from one form to another. An electric kettle converts electrical energy into heat energy. Some of that heat energy will be heating the water, but some of that heat energy will be wasted and will heat up the air. A microphone converts sound energy into electrical energy. Sometimes people assume that because this has a cable attached, it uses electrical energy, whereas in fact, it converts sound energy into an electrical signal. So looking at energy, the main reason why we study energy is for this first point here. It's one of the only reasons why we tend to study energy, and this comes straight from your specification. So energy transfers and efficiency. Energy can be transferred usefully, stored, or dissipated, but it cannot be created or destroyed. So the same amount of energy can only be transferred from one form to another, but we can't create it, nor can we destroy it. So it's conserved at all times. The second point, part B, says that when energy is transferred, only part of it may be usually transferred. The rest is um, what we call wasted energy, because it doesn't do the function that we want it to. It's interesting to note that there's not really any sort of energy transfers that are 100% efficient, and we always end up with some energy being wasted. The most common types of energy that are wasted, or the most common forms of energy that are wasted, they tend to be heat and sound, or thermal and sound. The final point goes on to say that wasted energy is eventually transferred to the surroundings, which become warmer. The wasted energy becomes increasingly spread out, and so becomes less useful. Understand what is conversion of energy, and the second one, what is conservation of energy. Okay, in the next slide, we will have a look at conversion of energy. What it means by conversion of energy? Well, conversion here refers to how energy can be converted from one particular form to another. Let's take a burning candle as an example. Well, you know that the candle has stored energy. And this stored energy is also known as chemical potential energy. So when the candle is burning, it gives out light and heat. You know that, right? So the energy conversion for this particular situation is from chemical potential energy changing to light and heat energy. 
Let's look at another example here. In this particular diagram, we find uh, we see that there's a battery and a light bulb, and there's some invisible wires connecting these two together. All right. So let us recap what's conversion of energy. Basically, it refers to how energy is converted from one particular form to another. So for this particular example, if you have been thinking in your head earlier on, well, the conversion of energy is from chemical potential energy changing to electrical energy and then to light plus a little bit of heat energy over here, then you are right. Okay. So now let's move on to COE. Well, what is COE? COE basically says this. It says that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be converted from one form to another. So to understand this, let me share this information about the amount of energy in our universe. I'm sure you know that there is a lot of energy in our universe. But do you know that this amount is fixed? Yes, indeed. The amount of energy in our whole universe is fixed, meaning that it remains the same. So this also means that energy cannot be created or destroyed because the amount of energy cannot change. It is fixed at that same fixed amount. Now, so let us go back to our earlier example of the burning candle over here. Let's imagine, okay, that a candle provides 100 joules of energy, of chemical potential energy, and if 70 joules of this is converted to light energy, my question to you is, how much heat energy is created? If you said 30 joules, then you're right. Indeed, the candle as it is burned up, <clears throat> 100 joules of energy from this chemical potential energy cannot be destroyed. Instead, it is converted to 70 joules of light and 30 joules of heat energy. Hence, this means that the amount of energy in this system of a burning candle is actually conserved. So if you look at this pendulum setup, I'd like you to just take a moment to have a look at how uh, as this pendulum bob swings from A to B repeatedly, I would like you to notice how the energy bar is changing over here. Kinetic energy is defined as the energy of a body due to its motion. The SI unit of kinetic energy is Joule and given by a capital J. Take note as well, kinetic energy, it is often that we refer to it in short as capital E and a small k. Okay, right, so let's try to understand more about kinetic energy. Kinetic energy can be simply understood as the energy of a moving object. So in other words, if the object is not moving, the object does not have any kinetic energy. So let's now try to understand a little bit more about kinetic energy. We know that it is the energy of a moving object. Now, let's have a look at this diagram. We see two vents of the same type. Both of them have the same mass. However, let's assume that the green vent is moving faster than the red vent. So the question is, which vent has more kinetic energy? I bet you know the answer. If you are thinking, it is the green vent, then you are right. Indeed, an object that is faster it has more kinetic energy. Okay, so in other words, to summarize, this simply means that for the same mass, the faster the object, the greater the kinetic energy. Now let's have a look at the second diagram. In this particular diagram, we see that we have a truck and a motorcycle. Clearly, the truck has more mass compared to the motorcycle. So, if both of them were to have the same speed, moving at the same speed, for example, which do you think will have more kinetic energy? So if you are thinking the truck, then that's correct. So in summary, objects moving at the same speed, okay, the greater the mass, the greater the kinetic energy. So from the previous slide, we can clearly see what affects the size of kinetic energy of a moving body. First, that will be the mass of the body. And secondly, that will be the speed of the moving body itself. So knowing that now EK or kinetic energy depends on mass and speed of a moving object, 
we can now calculate the amount of kinetic energy of a moving object. The formula that we use is simply this. Ek, capital E and the small k, is equal to the half, equals to half times m, which represents mass, times v, representing speed, square. Okay, so let me just uh, repeat that again. Ek equals to half mv square. Now, take note of some of the symbols here that we are using as well. I mentioned earlier on, m or small m, take note of the capital or the small letters here. This is important. Small m represents mass of a body. And take note that the mass of the body has to be in kilograms. Not grams, but kilograms. Small v here represents speed of, a bod of the moving body itself. And the speed of the body has to be in meters per second. Not centimeters per second, not kilometers per hour, but meters per second. And just to recap, the SI unit of kinetic energy EK is joules, capital J. So let's have a look at a typical problem or question uh, involving kinetic energy. Now in this problem, we have a toy car with a mass of 4 kg which was originally at rest. When the engine is switched on, it accelerates from rest and after 10 seconds, the speed is found to be 2 meters per second. 5 seconds later, its speed is found to be 3 meters per second. So the first question is this, what is the EK of the car when it is at rest? Explain. Now let's recall, kinetic energy is the energy of a moving object. So at the beginning when it's at rest, we know that it does not possess any speed. Therefore, the EK of the car or kinetic energy of the car at rest would be zero joules. This car is moving at 20 meters per second. Moving objects have kinetic energy and you should be able to calculate this. Here's the equation for kinetic energy. Remember that you are given this in the exam, so you don't have to learn this, but you do need to be able to use it. So kinetic energy in joules equals half multiplied by the mass in kilograms multiplied by the velocity squared. And remember that the velocity is in meters per second. Here's a question to try. If you want to, you can pause the video and try this yourself. A car has a mass of 800 kilograms and a velocity of 20 meters per second. Calculate the kinetic energy of the car. Okay, so here's the equation again. Kinetic energy equals half multiplied by the mass multiplied by the velocity squared. So the mass is 800 kilograms and the velocity is 20 meters per second. When we put these numbers into the equation, this gives us a value for the kinetic energy of 160,000 joules. Here's another one for you to try. A cyclist and bike have a total mass of 100 kilograms and a velocity of 15 meters per second. Calculate the kinetic energy. Here's the equation, and if you want to try this yourself, you can pause the video now. Well, the total mass of the cyclist and bike is 100 kilograms, and the velocity is 15 meters per second. Putting these numbers into our equation gives us a value for the kinetic energy of 11,250 joule. In summary, kinetic energy, what is kinetic energy? It is essentially the energy of a moving body. Once we know that, we will, we will need to know how to calculate amount of kinetic energy as well. So the amount of kinetic energy can be calculated by this formula, half mv squared, where m represents mass and v represents speed. Again, I would like to um, emphasize that the square, the 2 here represents v squared, not v times 2. And the last question is, what affects kinetic energy? Well, we have learned that there are two things that affect kinetic energy. The first is the mass of the body in kilograms and its speed in meters per second. What is gravitational potential energy? Symbol EP, capital E and a small p. What affects gravitational potential energy? Third, how to calculate gravitational potential energy? And the last, which is how is gravitational potential energy related to work done? So let's start our exploration here. Now, before we start to discuss more about gravitational potential energy, I would like to point out that there are two common forms of potential energy. The first one, which is the, the purpose of this video, is the gravitational potential energy. 
and it has something to do with um, this diagram. Okay, we are looking at the swimmer. She is uh, above, standing on the platform above the pool. We are also going to deal with potential or gravitational potential energy when we talk about uh, machines like this. This is a pile driver. Basically, it, what it does is that it is a mechanical hammer that is used to um, push pillars down into the ground. The second type of potential energy is elastic potential energy. So elastic potential energy is actually a, a kind of energy that is taught in objects which are elastic or stretchable, namely like springs and rubber bands. Okay. So gravitational potential energy. Now by definition, gravitational potential energy, symbol EP, is defined as the energy possessed by an object due to its position or height relative to the ground. What do we mean by relative here, you may ask? Um, relative simply means the, ob uh, the object's height or position from the ground. Okay? The SI unit of um, GPE is none other than joules, um, the symbol of which is a capital J. Now, in this slide, let us try to understand a little bit more about GPE or gravitational potential energy. We are going to do this by asking ourselves a few questions and referring to the diagram on the right hand side. Now, on this diagram, we see a man trying to lift a rock or a stone of certain mass M. Okay? Originally, the rock is on the ground. So, before he lifts it up to a height H, let's ask ourselves this question then. What is the EP or GPE of the rock on the ground? If you recall the definition of gravitational potential energy that it is the energy of an object um, depending on its height above ground, since this stone or rock is on the ground and therefore the height above ground is zero, the GPE of this rock on the ground would therefore be zero. So we see that um, height actually affects the amount of GPE. So let's say um, in this next uh, situation, the man actually lift this stone or the rock up to this high H, which is level to his head. Okay, so the, the question to ask is this, what happens to the GP of this rock if this man were to lift it up even further? Well, as you could have, uh, we would have guessed, since the position of the rock, if it's above his head, is higher than its original height H, the GPE of this rock above his head would be more than the GPE at this location. Again, this emphasizes that with greater height, we have a higher GPE. Now, let us then ask ourselves, what happens if this man were actually to leave a rock or a stone with a smaller mass? Okay, maybe a smaller rock. So, if this person were to leave a rock with a smaller mass to the same height, how would be the EP or the GPE of this rock be compared to lifting a rock of a greater mass? If you are thinking, well, if it's a, a rock with a smaller mass, therefore the GPE is smaller or lower, then you are right. So we see from here that the mass of the object that is being lifted also affects the, uh, the amount of gravitational potential energy that it has. Now the last question is this. What happens if this particular person were to repeat the same experiment, which is to leave a rock or a stone with a mass M to the same height here, instead of on the Earth, he repeats this on the Moon? Well, if you are thinking that, hey, if that's the situation, same mass, same height, but it's on the Moon whereby the gravity is less, and if you are thinking that this will actually um, reduce the gravitational potential energy of this rock compared to that on Earth, then you're right. Okay? So, the gravitational field strength of a particular place do actually affects the GPE of an object. So, that brings us to this next slide. From the previous slide, what have you learned about what are the factors that affects gravitational potential energy? And it's these three things that we have been discussing. First, the mass of the object small m. Second, gravitational field strength of that particular location, symbol small g. And the third will be the height of the object from ground, small h. So from here, we can actually calculate the amount of GPE of an object. 
Okay, so to, to calculate that, we will actually have to use this particular formula. EP, which is used to represent gravitational potential energy, can be simply calculated by taking the mass of the object, multiply the gravitational field strength of that location, and multiply h, the height of which the object is raised above ground. Okay, so do take note, small m, which represents mass, has to be in kilogram for this formula to work. g, or small g, represents gravitational field strength, in, uh, stated in terms of Newton per kilogram, and h, small h, representing the height of the object from ground, has to be in the unit meters. Not centimeters, not kilometers, but meters. And just to recap, the SI unit of GPE is none other than the joules. Now let's have a look at this example. Okay, This diagram shows a coconut tree with a coconut right at the top. Okay, um, This coconut before falling is 6 meters of, uh, above the ground. And the mass of the coconut is found to be 2 kilograms. For the part A, you are required to calculate its gravitational potential energy before it falls. So if that's the case, um, it's very simple. We just call out the formula and recall that to be EP equals to MGH. And substituting the mass into the equation or the formula, G on Earth is, if you recall, it is 10. And H, the height of the coconut above ground is 6 meters. Multiplying all of this together, we get 120 joules. The next question is this, what is the gravitational potential energy of the coconut when it is halfway, when it has fallen and it is halfway down, okay, at this position, 3 meters away? Well, since the height of this coconut is just 3 meters above ground, this will therefore suggest that the GPE would also be less. So how much less? Well, since the mass of the coconut remains the same, Earth's gravity remains at 10 in this location, and since the height is now 3 meters, by substituting the, into this equation, that will give us the answer of 60 joules. Last question. What would be the EP of the coconut when it's on the ground? Well, since it's on the ground, the height of this coconut above ground is 0, and therefore the potential energy of this coconut would be 0 joules on the ground. Alright, so let's um, look at how we can relate potential energy or gravitational potential energy to work done. So referring back to the same diagram, let's look at it in terms of work done. Obviously, for this person to raise a stone to this height h, he would have to exert some force. Okay, So by using some lift force, he's able to move the rock a distant h along the same direction as the uh, direction as, uh, of the force. Alright? So, in other words, when he does work to raise the rock, the rock by itself or the stone itself um, gains GPE. So, assuming that the work done by the person is 50 joules to lift the rock up to this height, then what would be the gain in GPE of the rock? Well, if you are thinking 50 joules, then you are right. Okay, The amount of work done by this person actually is the same as the gain in the gravitational potential energy of the rock at this same position. And so that brings us to the very last slide of this video. Um, we are just going to summarize what is gravitational potential energy. Okay, So what is gravitational potential energy or symbol EP? It is simply the energy of an object above ground. How do we then calculate the GPE? The formula that we use is MGH, where M stands for mass, G the gravity of the earth or gravitational field strength, and H represents the height of the object above ground. Recall as well, M, mass, has to be in kilogram. Gravitational field strength of Earth has to be in Newton per kilogram. And lastly, height of the object has to be in meters. And um, the last question is this. What affects gravitational potential energy of an object? Well, three things. First, that would be the mass. Second would be the gravitational field strength, and last would be the height of the object above ground. Energy is the ability of an object to do work. When work is done by an object, energy is transferred from the object. When a blind pops, for example, the air inside it does work on the surrounding air, 
In other words, it transfers energy to it, which is why a sound wave is created. When work is done on an object, energy is transferred to the object. Here, for example, by pushing this box through a distance, this man is doing work on or transferring energy to it. We say that the amount of work done is equal to the amount of energy transferred, so here, the amount of work done by the man is equal to the amount of energy he transfers to the box. Another way to think about energy and work is to think about money. Most people quite like money, and they really like having a lot of the stuff, but on its own, money is kinda useless. It's only through actually spending it that it becomes useful. In the same way, an object can have all the energy in the world, but it's only when work is done by that object, in other words, when its energy is transferred to another object, that interesting things start to happen. Believe it or not, a world without work would be a very boring place indeed. Energy, and therefore work done, are measured in joules. When we're talking about large amounts of energy though, we might use the units of kilojoules or megajoules instead. 1 kilojoule equals a thousand joules, and 1 megajoule equals a million joules. The total amount of energy in a closed system is constant. This important statement is called the principle of conservation of energy, and we'll come back to it in more detail a little later on. By system here, we mean an object or a group of objects. A closed system is one which is unaffected by anything that's happening outside of it. Energy can be stored by an object in a number of different ways. You've probably learnt about most of these before, even though you might have called them types or forms of energy, but these are the main energy stores which you'll have to know about for your exam. As we've just said though, interesting stuff only starts to happen when energy is transferred from one store to another, so let's look at some examples of energy changes in a system. When a tennis ball is thrown vertically upwards, energy is transferred from its kinetic energy store to its gravitational potential energy store. If this is a closed system, in other words, if the amount of energy transferred from the ball to the air is negligible, then the total amount of energy possessed by the ball will be constant. This is another way of stating the principle of conservation of energy. This means that, if the ball initially has zero joules of gravitational potential energy and ten joules of kinetic energy, then at the top of its motion, where it's stationary and about to start falling, it'll have ten joules of gravitational potential energy and zero joules of kinetic energy. Let's zip on through a few more examples. When we kick a football, energy is transferred from the chemical energy store in our bodies to the kinetic energy in our foot, which is in turn transferred directly to the kinetic energy of the ball. In a wind-up toy, energy is transferred from the elastic potential energy store of the spring inside it to its kinetic energy store. As we boil a kettle, energy is transferred from the electrostatic energy of the charges flowing around an electric circuit in our home to the internal energy of the water molecules inside the kettle. Where the charges get this electrostatic energy in the first place is another question that we'll deal with in a few videos time when we look at energy resources. When a driver brakes and decelerates a car to rest, its kinetic energy is transferred into the internal energy of the brakes and their temperature increases. When we hold these two magnets close together then release them, because like poles are repelled by one another, energy will be transferred from the magnetic to the kinetic energy store of both magnets. When we burn wood or another fuel, energy will be transferred from the chemical to the thermal energy store, and when we power a filament bulb using a battery as shown, energy will be transferred from the chemical energy store of the battery to the thermal or internal energy store of the filament. As the amount of thermal energy stored in the filament increases, its temperature increases too. When it gets hot enough, it'll start to emit visible light. As nice as it would be to just chat about energy, you'll also have to do some calculations in your exam. Let's start off by looking at gravitational potential energy, or GPE for short. The equation for the GPE of an object looks like this. Here, EP is the GPE of the object, which is measured in joules. M is its mass in kilograms. G is the gravitational field strength. which is measured in newtons per kilogram, and h is the height in meters above the point at which the GPE of the object is taken to be zero. Let's work through an example of using mgh. Here, we can see that the mass is 400 grams, 
The height is 1.2 meters and the value of G is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. The only thing to watch out for here is to make sure that you convert the mass into kilograms and 400 grams is of course not 0.4 kilograms. From there it should be plain sailing so our equation again is EP equals MGH then subbing in that becomes not 0.4 times 1.2 times 9.8 to give a final answer of 4.7 joules to one decimal place. Kinetic energy next, which is sometimes called Ke for short. The equation for the kinetic energy of a moving object looks like this. Here, Ek is the kinetic energy of the object in joules. M is its mass in kilograms and V is its speed in meters per second. Let's go through another quick example. Starting off using our equation, we have EK equals a half MV squared, then subbing in that becomes a half times 1500 times 20 squared to give a kinetic energy of 300,000 joules or in kilojoules, 300 kilojoules, or if you wanted to get really fancy in megajoules, not 0.3 megajoules. The different types of energy that exist and how they are either transferred from one object or one type of matter to another or how it's transformed into one type of energy into another. So we need to start with a quick review and we know that potential energy is energy that is stored and so you can sort of think of it as energy that is sort of waiting to do something. So here we've got uh, a picture of this guy with a ball at the top of a hill. And right now the energy that that ball has is potential because it's not actually doing anything right now. And we have to remember what energy is and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And the second major category of energy is called kinetic energy. And that's the energy of motion or the energy of what's happening or something that's going on right now. Now we've got this thing called the law of conservation of energy and earlier in the year we talked about the law of conservation of matter where you had a certain amount of matter before a chemical reaction and you had the same amount of matter after the reaction happened but the matter was just sort of rearranged. And the law of conservation of energy is very similar to that. It states that energy is never created or destroyed. It's only transferred from one thing to another or transformed from one type to another. So we've got some energy in this little blue dot here and that energy can be transferred from one object to another. So you see we've got the same type of energy. It's the same color. It's still a green E. That energy is being transferred from the blue to the pink. And in this case, now the energy is being transformed. So it's changing into a different type of energy. You see now we have the green E's are moving somewhere else and they're turning into a different type of energy. And that's represented here by the different color E. So we can look at energy being transformed by using a simple model here a pendulum and I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with it you know you've got a clock that has that little arm that swings at the bottom so take a, imagine that in your mind and when the pendulum reaches the top of its swing it actually stops for a moment and since it's not moving there's no kinetic energy all the energy there is stored potential energy and in this case it's gravitational potential energy So as the uh, arm of the pendulum begins to move, that potential energy is now being transformed into kinetic energy. So here, we've got both potential and kinetic energy. And when it reaches the middle of its swing, or the bottom of the swing, there's no potential energy anymore, and it's all kinetic because that arm is moving. And in a moment, we'll take a look at this in motion. Now, as the arm begins to swing upwards, the kinetic energy is now being transformed back into gravitational potential energy. And again, when it reaches the top of its swing, it's all potential energy and there is no kinetic energy there. 
So if we look at this in motion, you can see that it stops right there, and it stops right there. So each time it stops at either end of the swing, it's all potential energy. And when it reaches the middle right there, it's all kinetic energy. There is no gravitational potential energy there. Now in the middle of the swing, like right there or right there, there's a little bit of both. Alright, at position A, when we just release the pendulum bob at the beginning, notice that the speed is actually zero. As a result, since it's high above the ground, the PE was actually maximum at that position. All right? And notice that for as the bob passes through position B, the position of the bob is just slightly above the ground. This is considered to be the ground. If that's the case, the amount of GPE of the bob at position B is just slightly more than zero. In that case, as you look at this, it's just slightly more than zero. We will consider that to be effectively zero. Okay? So, let us start the journey here. Let us have a look at how the energy changes from position A to B. Okay? Take note that at position A, the GPE is maximum, while the KE is zero when it is at rest for a short moment. Right? So, as it swings towards B, notice that the kinetic energy at B is maximum right is maximum while the the gpe at position b is almost zero right so what's actually happening here well you would have guessed by now as the bob move from a to b it loses height the height above ground becoming is becoming less and less as a result the gpe is changing it is actually decreasing logically you also know that as the bob swings down to b the speed of the bob increases Therefore, the kinetic energy of the bob will actually increase. So as it moves from A to B, let's recognize that there's a drop in GPE and there's a gain of kinetic energy. So if there's a case from point, to a, from point A to B, the conversion of energy will be from GPE to kinetic energy of the bob. How about from B to C? You know that as the bob moves from B to C, it will start to slow down while it is in, uh, gaining height. So if that's the case, from B to C, we can say that the kinetic energy actually decreases, it loses kinetic energy, while it gains gravitational potential energy. So in other words, the conversion of energy from point B to C would be changing from kinetic energy to GPE. All right, now let us have a look at another example of a car moving down a slope. Again, have a look at how the energy bar is changing as the car moves down the slope. All right. At the highest point A, notice that the potential energy is highest at that position. And when the car is released, it will start to roll down the track. So as it rolls down the track, you know that the speed of the car will actually increase. So therefore, this is shown as an increasing rate bar over here. Okay. Since C is very near to the ground, you'll find that at position C, there's still a little bit of potential energy, right? And what's interesting is that when you look at the sum of the red and blue bar, both of these, when we sum it up, it will give us the same amount of total energy. So this means that energy is conserved. The total amount of energy at position A, which is purely gravitational potential energy, when once it reaches C, you will have somewhat a little bit of potential energy but a lot of kinetic energy when we sum these two up it will still give us the same amount okay so for the car to move from a to c in summary the energy change would be from gravitational potential energy changing to kinetic energy now just to give some numbers all right so if the gpe at position a is 100 joules as a car slides down the track and reaches this ground at this particular position, the kinetic energy of this car would therefore be 100 joules as well. Now, let's have a look at an example of how we can apply COE. Okay, let's look at this particular case whereby we have a ball with a mass of 5 kg 
and the ball is released from a building of 20 meters high. Okay, so let's calculate these three parts. Okay, the first will be the GPE of the ball before it starts to fall at 20 meters high. Its kinetic energy at the bottom of the building just before it strikes the ground. And lastly, the velocity of the ball just before it strikes the ground. So to calculate the potential energy, recall from the last video that we have a special formula for this purpose. Okay, and this formula is PE equals to MGH. Recall that M stands for mass, G for gravity on Earth, and H for the height in meters. Substituting all the values in, we get 5 kg of ball, the mass of the ball, 10 is the gravity on Earth, and 20 is the height. Of the building and therefore we find that the gravitational potential energy of the ball is a thousand joules. To solve part B which is to determine the kinetic energy of the ball just before it hits the ground, we can apply the conservation of energy. Recognizing that this total amount of energy remains the same at the top of the building and just before it hits the ground, we can therefore equate potential energy on the top of the building to be equal to the Ke at the bottom or near the or near the ground okay hence the kinetic energy of the ball just before it hit the ground will also be a thousand joules to solve part c which is to calculate the speed of the ball just before it hits the ground let's recall this equation for kinetic energy from the previous uh, video we also know, know that kinetic energy can be calculated with this formula which is half mv squared where m is the mass and v is the speed of the ball since we know from conservation of energy that Ke is now a thousand joules, right, we can rewrite the equation in this way. And solving it, we have V or the speed to be 20 meters per second. That physics is the study of matter and energy and the relationships between them. In our daily lives, we always interact with other objects and other surroundings. For example, we may be walking to the nearest bus stop, kick a ball, chew our food, turn our heads and so on and so forth. All these actions involve forces. Now, besides our awareness of forces, our experience also teaches us that somehow energy is involved. Don't you agree? You know that you need energy to walk around, to kick a ball or even to chew food. So in this chapter, I will try my best to help you understand these concepts of work energy and power. The first thing you should learn is that, in physics, we are interested mainly in how energy is used in a positive and productive manner. This provides the basis by which we understand the concept of work, which is the key concept addressed in this particular lesson. So what will you learn about work in this particular video? There are four key ideas that you need to learn. First, what is work or work done in physics? Second, what is not considered as work done? Third, how do we calculate work? And fourth, what is the SI unit of work? Right, now that brings us to this diagram. Let us start by asking this question. Between these two figure, one and two, who is actually doing work? Is it the man in figure one who is pushing against a wall or the hand in figure two that is pushing the box towards the east or to the right side? or both of them are considered to be doing work in physics. Well, if you have guessed figure 1, then you have gotten that wrong. But if you have guessed it's just simply figure 2, well, you got that right. From the physics point of view, only the hand in figure 2 is doing work. So why is that? So to answer this, let's have a look at how physics define work. In physics, we define work in this particular way. Work done by a constant force is given by the product of the applied force and the distance moved in the direction of the force. Now, if you are wondering what product means, product simply means multiplication. Okay, So, in order to calculate the amount of work, we simply multiply the applied force and the distance moved in the direction of the force. So, the direction of the force is so important. So, let's have a look at this diagram. Okay. If there is a constant force applied on the box and this constant force causes the box to move a certain distance along the same direction as the force, then in physics, we consider this to be work done by the constant force. 
So that brings us back to this diagram. Why do we consider figure 2, the hand in figure 2, to have done work? Right? Well, that is simply because the force that is applied by the hand had caused the box to move in the same direction as the force. So in other words, in other words the hand, the force applied by the hand has caused work to be done. Right? So this is some form of productive work. However, as for the man pushing against a wall, well, we know that he, use, he is using lots of energy, but this energy is not really productive or positive, isn't it? Why? Well, we know that the wall will not move no matter how hard the man pushes or how much energy he uses. Hence, from the physics point of view, since the force applied by the man does not cause the wall to move, no work is considered done by the man. So, from the definition of work, that gives us a formula to calculate the amount of work done. So, the formula for amount of work done is simply this. W for work done is equal to the amount of force applied multiply the distance traveled or moved by the object along the same direction as the force. The SI unit of work done is joules and the symbol that is used for this is a capital J. So, take note that this is a capital J. Right, so let's have a look at how we can apply the definition of work done to this particular problem. Now, in the diagram on the right hand side, it shows a waitress who is carrying a tray around while she is moving sideways. So the question is this, does the upward support force that she applies on this tray to keep it upright, does this upward force contribute to any work done in moving the waitress sideways? Well, if you have thought about it, the answer would be no. This support force is not uh, uh, contributing to any work done in moving the waitress subway, sideways. That is simply because the direction in which she is moving and the direction of force, they are not along the same direction. Now, the next question is this. On the right hand side, this uh, diagram shows a not so bright man trying to push a solid concrete wall. So is he doing any work? Well, if your answer is that there's no work done, then you've got that right. That's simply because the wall did not move. So no matter how much force this uh, not so bright person pushes onto the, onto the wall, well, he's just basically wasting energy. So in physics, we consider this to be no work done. Okay. Now to answer the second part, calculating the EK of the car when its speed is 2 meters per second. So let's recall that the formula to calculate the amount of kinetic energy is half mv square. By writing that down, we will have this. EK equals to half mv square and substituting m for mass, which is 4 kilogram over here. And at 10 seconds, when the speed is at 2 meters per second, we substitute into v and square that. Calculating this, we'll get 8 joules. All right. And for the next part, is the EK of the car when the speed is 3 meters per second more than that calculated in part B? Well, that is very obvious. When the car is moving faster, the kinetic of the car will be much faster than at part B. Now, in this slide, let's have a look at how to relate kinetic energy to work done. I'd like you to recall this diagram from lesson 1. The hand pushes on the box and, the, and this actually causes the box to move in the same direction as the force. From the pre previous lesson, we know that the work is done by the hand. All right? And this amount of work can be calculated by simply taking the force applied by the hand and multiplying that with the distance moved by this box. Now, let's assume that there is very little friction present between the box and the floor. So if that's the case, the force applied on the box will be able to move it very easily. In other words, we just need very little force to move the box. Even then, we know we recognize that there is some work done, right? So as a result of this work done, the moving box will, would have gained kinetic energy. So how do we then relate kinetic energy to work? Simply by this. The amount of work done by the hand will simply be equal to the kinetic energy of the box. 
To understand that a little bit better, let us use some numbers here. Right? So for example, if the amount of work done by the hand is 3 joules, these 3 joules will be the same uh, amount of energy that the box would have in terms of kinetic energy. All right? So what happens if there is friction present? In reality, there is always friction. All right? So what is going to happen? Well, you know that for a fact, if there is friction present, we will definitely need more force to move the box. In other words, if we do apply more force to move a certain distance, this will mean that there will be more work needed as compared to the situation whereby there is no friction present. So in order to move the box and to overcome friction, the amount of work done by the hand now will be equal to the kinetic energy of the box plus the amount of work done that is needed to overcome friction. So let us assume that the amount of work done by the hand now has increased. In the previous slide, if the amount of work done is 3 joules, right now when friction is present, the amount of work done is more. So let us assume that the amount of work done by the hand is now 5 joules. In order to move the box, okay, the box which is moving, it will have possessed kinetic energy and let's say the kinetic energy of the box is 3 joules. So therefore, the extra 2 joules is used to overcome friction. The weight of an object is the force acting on it due to gravity. Because weight is a force, the unit of weight is the newton. The weight is the mass in kilograms multiplied by the gravitational field strength in newtons per kilogram. So what is the gravitational field strength? Well, this is a measure of gravity. On the Earth, this is a value of 10 newtons per kilogram. However, the value of the gravitational field strength is different for different planets. Let's look at the typical question. A car has a mass of 900 kilograms. Calculate its weight on Earth. So remember that the equation is weight in newtons equals the mass in kilograms multiplied by the gravitational field strength in newtons per kilogram. This gives us a value for the weight of the car of 9,000 newtons. The key thing to get from this video is that the unit of weight is the newton since that often comes up in exams. By the end of this video, you should be able to calculate the change and gravitational potential energy of an object. In a previous video, we looked at the idea of work done when an object's lifted against gravity. Remember that work done is a type of energy transfer, so it has the unit joules. Joules has a symbol capital J. So here's an example that we looked at. A person with a mass of 50 kilograms walks up a flight of stairs. The distance from the bottom of the stairs to the top is 5 metres. Calculate the work done by the person climbing the stairs. Work equals force multiplied by distance. The person is walking upstairs, so they're opposing the force of gravity. In this case, the force acting is equal to the person's weight, but remember that the person's force is acting upwards. So the weight is the mass multiplied by the gravitational field strength. The mass is 50 kilograms. The gravitational field strength is 10 newtons per kilogram, and that's given in the exam, so you don't need to learn it. So this gives us a weight of 500 newtons. Therefore, the value of the force acting as the person walks up the stairs must also be 500 newtons. The distance is given in the question, it's 5 meters. Therefore, the work done is 500 newtons multiplied by 5 meters, which gives us a value of 2,500 joules. So we know that 2,500 joules of work has been carried out. But what has happened to that energy? Well, it's been converted to a different form called gravitational potential energy. In this video, we're going to learn how to calculate the change in gravitational potential energy. It's really easy and the equation is given in your exam. I've got here a ball with a mass of 2 kilograms and I'm lifting it from the floor to a shelf with a height of 2 meters. We need to calculate the change in gravitational potential energy. Here's the equation. Change in gravitational potential energy equals the mass multiplied by the gravitational field strength multiplied by the height. Well, we know that the mass is 2 kilograms. The value of the gravitational field strength is 10 newtons per kilogram, and you are given that in the exam. The height is 2 meters. So this gives us a value for the change in gravitational potential energy of 40 joules. Now, the next slide basically summarizes um, what we understand as work and what is not work done. The first row, 
if you look at this diagram, it shows a force being applied on a on an object. And if this object were to move in the same direction as the force, we consider this situation to be work done. Work done by the force applied on the box. In the second diagram over here, if we apply a force on an object and there's no movement as a result of the uh, applied force, we will consider this to be no work done in physics. And for the last diagram, if there's an upward force, for example, applied on this object, however, the object is moving in and uh, in a direction that is different from the force. If there's a situation, we will consider this problem to be no work done as well. Right. We come to this last example where we will try to apply the formula for work done on this particular problem. So a force of 10 newton is used to toss a coin upwards into the air. If the coin rises 20 meters before it starts to come down, what is the work done by the one who tosses the coin? All right. So what's the equation to calculate work? The equation is W equals to F times D. All right. So how do we present our solution here? Well, you have to start off by writing capital W equals to capital F times D. Take note that the capitals and the small letters matters over here. Then we substitute the force with the force that is applied here, 10 newtons, and the distance that is traveled in the same direction as the force, which is 20 meters. By multiplying these two, that will give us 200 joules. Now, I'd like to highlight over here and emphasize the units for force and the distance traveled. For force, it has to be in newtons, not kilonewtons. And for distance, it has to be in meters. So if a problem were to be phrased such that the, the distance travel is not in meters, but in centimeters or millimeters, you will have to actually change that into meters before you multiply these two numbers together. So this brings us to the last slide for this particular video. So uh, do allow me to summarize what we have learned so far. Okay, there are four points if you recall. First, what is work done in physics? Well, in physics, we consider work to be done when the force applied on an object causes the object to move in the same direction as the force. So what is not work done? Well, if the force that is applied on an object does not produce any movement, or the object is actually moving in a direction that is different from the force applied, in physics, we consider this to be not work done. How to calculate work? Well, that is given by this formula, capital W equals to capital F times D. And finally, what, the, what is the SI unit of work? That would be joules, and the symbol for that will be a capital J. In physics, work is done on an object when a force causes it to move through a distance. We say that the force has done work on the object the amount of work done on the object is equal to the amount of energy transferred to it. Have a look at this man as he pushes this box to the right. The force he's pushing with causes the box to move through a distance. We say that the man has done work on the box, which means that he's transferred energy to it. Work is only done by a force when it causes an object to move in the same direction as it. Work is not done when the object doesn't move in the direction of the force. For example, because these men are applying equal and opposite forces to the box, it isn't moving and work isn't being done on it. In this example, the resultant force acting on the box is zero, but there are even some times at which a resultant force acting on an object won't do work on it. If we think about the moon as it orbits the earth, for example, it's always traveling at a tangent to its orbit like this but the gravitational force pulling it towards the Earth is always at a right angle to this orbit, like this. Here, even though there is a resultant force acting on the Moon due to the Earth's gravity, the amount of work done on it by this force is zero because it never actually moves closer to the Earth. Let's get on to some maths now. The equation for work done looks like this. W equals F times S. W here stands for the work done by a force which is measured in joules. F stands for the force in newtons and S 
stands for the distance moved in the direction of the force, which is measured in meters. Just in case it comes in handy, the formula triangle for this equation looks like this. If you're very unlucky in the exam, you might be set a question like this. I know that reads like the kind of thing that physics nightmares are made of, but all the examiner is looking for here is a simple one sentence answer that looks exactly like this, so it would be well worth learning off. As you can see, one joule of work is done on an object when a force of one newton causes its displacement to change by one meter. We can use our new equation to explain where this sentence comes from. If F is one newton and S is one meter, then W is just F times S, which is one times one to give an answer of one joule. This equation actually also helps explain that one joule is the same as or is equivalent to one newton meter because in the equation we multiplied something in newtons by something in meters to give the work done which was in joules. We actually say that both units, joules and newton meters, are equivalent to one another. If that all seemed a bit theoretical, the questions in the exam should be quite a lot more straightforward, like this one. Why don't you pause the video now and give it a quick go before playing again? You should see right away here that the force is 700 newtons and the distance, which is in centimetres, has to be converted into metres for the equation, so that becomes 2 metres. After this, it's just a straight substitution, so work done is force times distance, which is 700 times 2, which gives an answer of 1400 joules. This question is just a little bit trickier. As you can see, the force applied by this man is 550 newtons and he does 2.2 kilojoules of work. In part A, we need to work out what distance he's pushed it through, so let's go. The only real complication for part A is the use of kilojoules in the question, but if we remember that 1 kilojoule is just 1000 joules, 2.2 kilojoules will be 2200 joules. After that, it's just a matter of using our equation for work done, which is force times distance, rearranging to make distance the subject, so S equals W divided by F, and then subbing in our numbers from above. That gives 2200 divided by 550, which gives an answer of 4 meters. To answer part B, we need to think about the horizontal forces acting on the box. We know that the man is pushing it to the right with the force of 550 newtons. Because the box isn't speeding up or slowing down, that means that there must be an equal and opposite force of friction acting on it. That of course will have a value of 550 newtons also. What we can say then for the answer is that the energy transferred by the man is converted by this frictional force into heat energy in the box and the ground. This will cause the temperature of the box and the ground to increase a little. Have a look now at this last example for this video. As you can see, my snazzy red car is driving 10 meters up a hill. Its weight is 15 kilonewtons and the frictional force between its tires and the road surface is 4 kilonewtons. For part A, we've been asked to work out the amount of work it does against friction, so let's give it a go. This question is all about choosing the correct numbers to go into the equation for each part. In part A, using our equation work done equals force times distance, we need a force of 4000 newtons to overcome the friction, and the car moves up along the slope by a distance of 10 meters. So the answer, of course, is just 40,000 joules, or 40 kilojoules. For part B, we need to calculate the amount of work the car does against gravity. If its weight is pulling the car downwards with a force of 15 kilonewtons, that means that the car must be pushed upwards with an equal and opposite force to increase its height by 5 meters. Once we've worked that out, the question becomes very straightforward. So again, starting off with the same equation, work done equals force times distance, and then subbing in our numbers, the force is 15,000 newtons, and the distance is five meters. That gives an answer of 75,000 joules, or 75 kilojoules. The relationship between weight and mass is that weight is mass times the gravitational field. And on Earth, it's 10 newtons for every kilogram. That means if you had a mass of one kilogram, 
the weight would be 10 newtons. So a typical mass of a person might be 50, 60 kilograms, means it's 500, 600 newtons on Earth. So if you've got the moon, gravitational field strength on the moon is a lot less, so you weigh a lot less, but your mass is exactly the same. Work done is a term for energy used when a force moves a distance. Another equation here, using the formula, work done is force times the distance moved. Remembering work done is a type of energy, so it's measured in joules. How many joules it takes to move a certain force a certain distance. Again, you can put it in a triangle, which will help you to rearrange it. The next equation is for high air only, and it's all about kinetic energy, movement energy. An object that moves has a certain amount of kinetic energy. The equation looks quite complicated, and the tip is that if you start at the end, you square the velocity, the speed of the object, multiply it by the mass, multiply it by a half, and it gives you how much kinetic energy that moving object has. And again, it's an energy, all energy is measured in joules. And here's the equation here. You will be given it on the, on the paper. You just need to be able to rearrange it if necessary. Power is defined as the rate of work done. And the SI unit of power is the watt, W-A-T-T, -T, and the symbol for this watt is none other than the capital W. Now, at this present moment, I would like to highlight that this capital W will seem sim similar to work done, but I would like to caution that they mean different thing altogether. Next, let's have a look at the formula to calculate power. All right? So, the formula to calculate power is this, P is equal to W over T. P, capital P, take note of the lettering, capital P stands for power and capital W here stands for work done and the small t stands for time. Now to work this formula, please take note of the units that we will, new, we will use for work. Work has to be in joules while time has to be in seconds. Another version of the formula is this. Okay, Since we know that work done is uh, the formula for work done is force multiplied by distance. We can actually substitute that into this particular equation and as a result, we get this form. Another different form of the original formula itself. Now, how can we understand power? All right? We can understand it simply by this. Is the amount of work done or the amount of energy used up in one second. All right? Therefore, the formula is such power is equal to work done over time right so when we do the division uh, here work when we divide by time we actually get the amount of work that is completed in one second since it can also be understood as the amount of energy used up this formula can have another form which is this p equals to e over t all right for this case take note that e here is a capital e and the energy that is being used up can be in two possible forms for all levels. E can be either referring to kinetic energy that is changing or the gravita gravitational potential energy that has changed or has been used up in one second. Okay. Right. To understand power further, it is best to learn from some work example. Okay. Now, the first example is this. Who is going to complete the same amount of work at a shorter period of time? Now, what is the case here? The case is simply this. If there are two persons who are needed to lift 50 books of the same mass from the ground to a shelf that is 1.5 meter high. Now, the first person is Ali, who took 10 minutes to complete this task, while Amy took 5 minutes to complete the same task. Well, in this sense, I would like to ask them the question, who is more powerful? Would it be Ali, who took 10 minutes or Amy who took 5 minutes to, to complete the same task. If you are thinking that Amy is the answer, then you are right. This much work, lifting 50 books from the ground to the shelf in a shorter period of time will mean that Amy is more powerful. Now let's have a look at the next example here. Which machine does the most work or converts the most energy in the same amount of time? The example here refers to two washing machines, A and B. Right? Washing machine A washes 6 kg of laundry in 20 minutes. For the same amount of time, which is 20 minutes, 
a machine B washes only 5.5 kg. So which machine is more powerful? Well, we can see that A does a little bit more work since it is washing 6 kg of laundry compared to B, which is just washing 5.5 kg of laundry. So if that's the case, we can conclude that machine A has done more work in the same amount of time. So as a result, machine A is considered to be more powerful than machine B. What? What, if you recall, is the unit of power? There's a definition of watt here as well, which I will give it as simply this. One watt is defined as the power delivered when one joule of work in that is done in one second. All right. The definition of watt is something for you to just um, to understand, but we will not really talk too much about it in this video. All right. Now let's just have a look at other examples here. All right. The first example is this. We will need to calculate the power involved when a force of 50 newton is used to move a distance of 10 meters in 5 seconds, meaning to move a box in 5 seconds. So what would be the power involved? So if we can see that uh, some work has been done, we can call upon the formula of P equals to F times D, where F times D is actually work done, and divide that by time. So the force here will be 50 newtons, we substitute that directly here, and the distance traveled will be 10 meters. And we divide that by time, which is in 5 seconds. Calculating this, we will get a power that is simply 100 watt. Again, from this example, I want to highlight the correct use of unit. For force, it has to be in newtons. For distance, it has to be in meters. And for time, it has to be in seconds. Now, let's have a look at another example here. This example refers to a box of bricks with a mass of 100 kg being lifted up vertically by a lift for 12 meters in 20 seconds. Now, Earth's gravitational field strength is 10 newtons per kilogram. So how do we solve this particular problem? Well, in this situation, we see that there is some form of energy that is being used. Since this form of energy, as we can recognize that as GPE, we can reuse the formula power equals to energy over time. E over T. Since it's gravitational potential energy, we can substitute EP as simply MGH, where M is a mass, G is the gravitational field strength, and H is the height of the bricks above ground. Uh, substituting the respective values in 100 kg multiplied 10, which is gravity, and the height 12 meters divided by 20, we get this answer of 600. So that basically brings us to the end of this uh, slide. I will end it off with a summary of power. So what is power? Power is simply known as the rate of work done or rate of energy use. Take note, the definition of power is simply given as the rate of work done. What is the SI unit of power? That is the watt with a capital W as a symbol. And how do we calculate power? Power is simply calculated with this formula. P, capital P, is equal to capital W over time. This refers to work and this refers to time. Or, in another form, power can be equal to E over T as well, where E refers to energy, and there are two forms of energy that we can refer it to. That is the GPE, or gravitational potential energy, and the kinetic energy. And the last part is how do we understand power? Well, simply, Power is understood as how much work is done or energy that is being used up in one second. Work in physics means the energy transferred by a force. It's therefore measured in joules because it's a measure of energy. And the equation is work done equals force multiplied by distance moved in the direction of that force. This formula can be used in two other forms to find a specific type of energy. So gravitational potential energy is the mass times by g, the Earth's feet gravitational field strength, times by height. And kinetic energy is a half multiplied by mass multiplied by speed squared. You need to know all of these formulae. They're not given on the exam. Here's an example involving some of these formulae. So how much kinetic energy does a 900 kilogram car have traveling at 30 meters per second? 
The formula you'd need to solve this is the kinetic energy formula. So that's a half times by the mass in kilograms multiplied by the velocity in meters per second should give 405,000 joules. Now supposing the car is now brought to a halt by its brakes and you know that they can apply a force of 5,000 newtons. How far does it travel before it stops? Well we want to work out a distance. So this would be the formula we'd want. Distance would be work done divided by force. The work done is given here. We've just calculated the energy it needs to get rid of. So distance is work over force and the work is the number we've just calculated divided by the force which we're given gives 81 meters. When a pendulum swings it transfers gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy and over one or two swings assuming there's very little friction you can assume that all the gravitational potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. So you can say that it's a hundred percent efficient in its energy transfer. If you assume this it means we can work out how much kinetic energy it'll have and therefore work out how fast it's traveling based on how high it was released from. So assuming the transfer is a hundred percent efficient all the gravitational potential energy goes into kinetic energy. Let's put that in practice. So how fast would a pendulum swing if it was released from 20 centimeters above the ground? So firstly don't forget to convert into standard units. Well we can equate the two energies and the energy equations and you'll notice that m is the same on both sides of the equation so it cancels and we're left with gh is a half v squared. We want v on its own so we can remove this term and put it onto this side of the equation by multiplying both sides by 2. So I get v squared is 2gh. If I substitute in the numbers I get 2 multiplied by 10 multiplied by 0.2 meters, that's the vertical height. I get v squared is 4. Therefore v is the square root of 4 or 2 meters per second. Some GCSE questions take you through this process step by step and get you to calculate the gravitational potential energy first and then the kinetic energy. But the principle is the same. You assume that the energy is the same um, when it transfers and that none is wasted. Power is the rate of transferring energy. Therefore it's work done or energy divided by time taken. One watt is one joule of energy transferred per second. Let's do an example. How much energy would be transferred by a 50 megawatt power station in two hours? Don't forget first to use standard units. 50 megawatts is 50 million watts. And two hours corresponds with 7,200 seconds. Now we can put the power equation, work done is power times time. We want to work out the amount of energy transferred and that's the work. Power times time gives us a large number, 3.6 times 10 to the 11 joules.